I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, uh, recognise that sovereignty over this land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, I also want to begin by acknowledging and thanking the role of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign in Melbourne and LASNET, the Latin American Net uh, Solidarity Network, uh, for helping to organise the fact-finding mission of which I was part of and which the aim of today is to report back on. And so I also want to thank the local committee of the Australia-Venezuela Solidarity Network for allowing me the opportunity to be able to come here today and talk to you and give you a bit of information of what we were able to find during our fact-finding mission. Obviously, it's impossible to broach everything in a short amount of time. I hope to keep this talk to about 30, 40 minutes to allow plenty of time for question and answers and comments and discussion, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of those um, that, that people will want to ask. So it's impossible for me to cover really important things, such as, for instance, the whole history of the political process leading up to what is occurring today in Venezuela, the role that the US government has played in, 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 in the situation in Venezuela, the impact of the sanctions, the, the economic crisis and what underpins that. All of these are extremely important issues but are just impossible for me to deal with in the time that I have. Of course, others have done a much and can do a much better job than me and have written about these things and I'd encourage people to read those, those articles. I'm happy to also answer any of these in the question and answer time. But really, as I said, the focus of what I want to talk about today is what we saw when we were in Venezuela. So what was the purpose of our trip? What we found was that no matter what we said about what was occurring in Venezuela, almost always we would get the exact same response. Well, why don't you go to Venezuela and see what's happening there for yourself? Well, we took up the challenge and we decided that we would go there and see exactly what it was that was happening on the ground. And what we found was a Venezuela, and, well, and just to explain, when I say we went to Venezuela, we didn't just go to Caracas, we didn't just go to the eastern suburbs of Caracas, um, we went to the west side of Caracas, which are the poorer neighbourhoods, but we also went out of Caracas as well, travelling through regional states like as Barinas and taking us all the way down to the state of Apure, which is down on the border with Colombia. So our aim was to get as broad a possible a picture of what was occurring today in Venezuela, rather than limiting ourselves to just hearing one or two voices, our aim was to get as many voices as possible. We met with a whole range of different organisations, community councils, communes, representatives of the LGBTI community, feminist organisations and members from the trade unions. Uh, we also met with representatives uh, from the, the, um, the revolutionary current Bolivar and Zamora, who some of you may know as one of their representatives came out to Australia uh, in 2017 and gave a, gave a, a speaking to around here. There are many other organisations that I could list that we also were able to meet with the national networks of communes um, and, and many others that, that I could list during our two weeks there. But overall, the media, the image, or the, what we saw in the reality of everyday Venezuela was one that was very starkly different to what was portrayed in the media. And I think, for me, certainly there was two things of very great note of how different the Venezuela that exists in reality is to the one that exists in the media that we receive every day. The first was the completely different political climate, even to the one that I expected going to Venezuela. When you put in the context of an unfolding coup in Venezuela, and I think there's no other way to describe what the so-called self-proclamation of Juan Guaido as interim president of Venezuela represents, I'm happy in discussion to expand on that idea and why I believe that this is essentially a, a US-led attempted coup in Venezuela. But in, whether you see it as a coup or not, in a context of essentially two competing presidents deciding as, as to who is the, the le legitimate head of the, sta of the state, when you consider that we arrived uh, roughly about a week after the very tense situation that had occurred on the Venezuela-Colombian border, where you had the US government and their stunt of trying to get uh, so-called humanitarian aid uh, into the country and all of the tension that was built up around that, um, when you consider that every day in the media there are constant reports of supposed ruptures and uh, potentials of military coup and Juan Guaido constantly calling for the military to come out and, 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 and uh, bring down the Maduro government, one was expecting a country on, on, the verge of, on the verge of civil war almost. Yet when we arrived it was completely different. And just to give you one example, literally the day um, that me and Lucho Riquelme, one of the other participants in the brigade, arrived, we arrived on March 5. 
This was just a few hours or the, the day after Juan Guaido had returned into Venezuela. He had previously left Venezuela despite not being allowed to because he's currently got bail conditions that don't allow him to. He had left the country to participate in the stunt on the Colombian-Venezuelan border on the Colombian side. He then subsequently travelled to a number of other countries. Despite that, on, on March 4, he returned to the country, entered the country without any problems and it called for, for protests. So this has occurred just hours before we arrived and we arrived on the day of the anniversary of, of Chavez's death. Um, and yet when we arrived in Caracas, it was quiet. There was very little going on. And there was a simple explanation for that, that it was the weekend of Carnival, one of the most important holiday weekends for, ordinary, for Venezuelans who preferred rather than to involve themselves in this dispute happening up above uh, between Guaido and Maduro, preferred to be visiting family, uh, going to the beach as many of them spent um, spent, uh, uh, usually spend uh, Carnival. But this calmness that we saw, this relative stability in a country that presented outside, of the, outside as one on the verge of, of collapse and on the verge of civil war was one that we presenced everywhere we travelled, in Apure, Barinas uh, and in Caracas. Of course, this is not to say that there was no protest while we were there. We saw a number of protests, although everyone agreed that we spoke to that in general most of the protests where the pro-anti-government were much smaller than protests that have occurred in previous years. Of course, it also didn't mean that there was discontent amongst people, and I'll return to this issue uh, later. And of course, we didn't go and visit every single corner of every single city of every single state of Venezuela, so we can't claim to have seen absolutely everything that occurred in those two weeks. Um, and we acknowledge that there were probably events that occurred while we were there that we weren't able to presence and see. But what I can say is that during those two weeks, this is what, this is what we were able to, to presence. And it was also a message that was constantly repeated to us from Venezuelans of both sides of politics that we spoke to when we were there. That this idea of an image of a country where people are on the verge of killing each other, on the verge of civil war, is simply just not the case. And I should add that our visit should be put into the context of the first major blackout that occurred in Venezuela at the start of March as well. So when we were there, depending on which part of the country you were in, from anywhere between two to perhaps five, six, seven days, uh, people did not have electricity, and as a result of not having access to electricity, did not have access to running water, to telecommunications, and a number of other aspects that were affected by the, by the, the, the lack of electricity. So this was in a situation where possibly in any other country we would have seen a very different reaction, and yet one being in Venezuela could almost forget of, you know, the supposed competing two presidents that at least exist on paper, as for the majority of people, life went on. The second, though, important and noticeable aspect of everyday life was just how extremely hard it is for Venezuelans to get through every day. It's not the way that it's portrayed in the media, but that's not to say that every day is not an extremely hard day for Venezuelans, no matter what their political persuasions, no matter what part of the country they live in. Whilst when I say it's not the same as what the media portrays and why it's a much more complex situation is to give you a few examples of, of how, we, how we saw what was occurring in, in Venezuela. So, of course, in, in the media, a lot is made of the supposed shortages, that empty, empty shelves in supermarkets. Well, that was not a reality that we came across in any of the shops um, that we visited. Um, people talked to us about a few years ago of that being a very serious problem, of not being able to obtain a number of very important basic goods, and acknowledged that today medicine continues to be a very important good that is very hard to come across, but that in general basic food produce was more than available on shelves and was certainly visible wherever we travelled. And, but there was a flip side to this, and that is that when you compared the prices, when you looked at the fact that the impact that hyperinflation had had on the prices of those goods, compared to the minimum wage, which on average is, a, is roughly about four to six dollars US, um, this would allow you to buy the equivalent of one egg a day. That's what a minimum wage would actually allow you to do if you were just living off a minimum wage uh, in Venezuela. Of course, a situation that's almost unten well, it, 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 untenable unless there are other circumstances and other things to, to uh, allow, people, uh, allow people to survive. It's almost impossible to imagine how this, how this could happen. There are other issues that I could do, speak about, about this very complex and very difficult situation that ordinary Venezuelans are dealing with. And I'm happy to give more examples if people would like in discussion. But rather than focus on giving the examples, 
And what I want to try and do is we'll explain this situation then. How do we have a situation where, on the one hand, a very deep economic crisis is dramatically affecting the lives of everyone, but obviously impacting on the poor the most? How supposedly, at least from the outside, we're giving this image of this powerful movement, this powerful struggle supposedly for democracy, whose visible head is Juan Guaido, but yet within, uh, but which as I said, is nothing more than a US-led coup attempt, and which has, although it has unprecedented international support, is hardly visible within the country itself. And that was once again revealed by the demonstrations that Juan Guaido called for on January 6th, so last night for us. Well, there was a very poor turnout, um, and even opposition sectors acknowledged that there was a very poor turnout for the protests being called by Juan Guaido, but not the image that we're given outside of the country. And despite all this, we have a population largely attempting to get on with life as difficult as it is. How do we explain this? This is what I want to focus on on my talk. Um, and as I said, I'm happy to give more examples in, uh, of, of the everyday life in Venezuela, uh, if people would like me to talk about that in discussion. Well, the first thing to, when trying to explain how this is the case is to understand that the US and the opposition and the media simply can't explain it. They can't explain it because for them, all they simply say is that every day Maduro's gonna fall, tomorrow's a day he's gonna fall, and yet Maduro's still there. They've been saying that for years, they said that about Hugo Chavez before that, and in the last, since January 23, almost on a daily occurrence, although in the last week or so, less as they're forced to see a reality that, that, uh, that Nicolas Maduro isn't going to go away any, any, any day soon. They present a picture as that it's all simply a case of uh, this is, you know, that it's all simply a case of this is a dictatorship, yet they ignore the fact that there are much more repressive dict uh, actual dictatorships in the region itself that are constantly violating human rights and where protests occur on a daily basis and where the governments are constantly being threatened uh, by popular, popular uprisings. And of course, they also ignore the very strong history of popular struggle that exists within the Venezuelan people. Whether we go back 200 years and the role that Venezuela played in helping to liberate not just Venezuela from Spanish colonialism, but a number of other countries to more recent experiences of struggle, for instance, such as the Caracazo, an uprising of three or four days in, 18, in, in sorry, 1989. It was only through actual real brute repression where something, estimates put it up to three or 4,000 people were massacred in the space of three or four days by the previous neoliberal governments. Um, and yet that, that history of struggle continues to exist amongst the Venezuelan people. Of course, all of that is simply erased and we're just presented with an image of helpless people who can't get out of this situation. That can't explain the situation because one, it has no basis in reality, and two, is actually a, an, uh, an explanation that fundamentally works against the opposition being able to change the situation. This narrative of helpless victims may help in trying to promote calls for foreign intervention, and that is exactly what, most of, what a large section of the opposition wants, and is functional to building support outside of the country but as I said, lacks a basis in reality and actually does a disservice to the opposition whose support base largely gets demobilised by this rhetoric, not to mention those who may not even support the government but don't support the opposition, and certainly above everything else, do not support foreign intervention and the threat of war when they understand that the missiles that rain down are not simply going to be hitting one side of politics. So how do we explain it? I think in order to explain the current situation and understand what is occurring in Venezuela today, First is that it has to begin with a recognition and an acknowledgement of the gains of the past two decades under the Bolivarian Revolution. It's true that many of these have been rolled back as a result of the deep economic crisis, but, none of them, but they've not been rolled back completely. And there are a number of cases that you can see how these gains act as very important uh, uh, safety, or not safety, but very important aspects of cushioning the worst aspect of the economic crisis whether that be the two to three million homes that have been built, meaning that people at least at the very minimum are able to count with a roof over their heads, whether it be the continued presence of local doctors in, in the local community, something that did not exist prior to the Chavez government, but continues to exist under the Maduro government, whether it be that they have access to basic services that are amongst the cheapest in the, well, are the cheapest in the region, whether we look at electricity, water, telecommunications, petrol, 
All these are by far the cheapest in Venezuela and have the greatest connectivity. That is, the vast majority, we're talking almost 100% connectivity for a lot of these, these basic services that are... The prices, if I was to give you the exact number, are so close to zero, you'd have to round them down and, and, and are, essentially, are essentially free basic services. Access to, for instance, in Caracas, the free metro train system is free access of, of public transport. So these gains continue to exist, combined with more recent measures that the government has taken to try to deal with the, ex with the extreme situation caused by the deep economic crisis. And perhaps the most important of these initiatives are what is referred to as the, as the CLAPS, the Local Committees for the Production and Distribution of Food, which is essentially a way that the government imports a whole bunch of food and through local committees in the local areas, those are distributed box uh, house to house to people to be able to get, again, so cheap that it's borderline free um, uh, food to be able to at least meet some of the most essential needs when it comes to, to food produce. So this is a first part of trying to explain what's occurring in Venezuela today. Second has to also begin with a recognition of the ongoing importance of community organisation in Venezuela today. Uh, the CLAPS, the, what did I mention, the food box, the uh, committees, the distribution of the food boxes, are uh, one example, but they're only the latest example, um, and arguably not even the most important example of real independent community organisation that continues to exist despite the economic crisis. And I think most important here is the bodies of grassroots democracy that were encouraged under Chavez and continue to exist under the Maduro government, that of those, that of, those of the communal councils and communes. Communal councils and communes as spaces where communities can get together to discuss and debate their most pressing problems, to come together and debate how to resolve those pressing problems, and faces that have become beyond just level of discussion and going on to becoming networks for the distribution of production from commune to commune, so communes in the countryside, linking up with those in the city in order to be able to get food directly to those, those that most need it. This vast infrastructure or network of organisation, of community organisation, continues to exist and we were able to visit a number of these experiences. And together, as I said, with production of food, distribution of food, the networking amongst each other, the exchange of goods, the creation of production chains without intermediaries, all of this has been another important aspect of being able to deal with the everyday um, difficulties that Venezuelans have to deal with. Of course, these networks also provide a very important access for information as well about the realities of what's going on uh, in, in Venezuela. So there's two things that I think are almost always missing from any of the discussion about Venezuela today, but are, without recognising and acknowledging, cannot, you cannot begin to comprehend why we have the situation that we have today in Venezuela. Deep economic crisis, supposed international or international pressure to overthrow a government, and yet large, largely a politically, political stability within the country and important support that continues to exist for the government. I think there are two, three other things that are important to acknowledge as well. The next two that I'm going to mention I think are more negative aspects of the reality of Venezuela today. The third aspect that needs to be recognised is the huge cultural shift that has occurred in Venezuelan society. The huge shift that has occurred in consumption patterns as people try to deal with the, 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 the everyday hardships that are occurring. Of course, on the most visible level, uh, we could talk about the changes in consumption patterns from the boom period under Chavez, when oil was $100, $120 a barrel, and the redistribution of that wealth meant that people were able to buy not just one phone, but two or three phones, are able to buy uh, trademark uh, clothes, uh, Adidas or Nike or you know, whatever it might be, um, to a situation today when clearly those products are completely out of the reach of people. If your salary is buying you one egg a day, the idea of buying a designer jacket is al almost impossible and even just maintaining your phone becomes, becomes a, a difficulty. But the shift in, in, cult in the, the cultural shift goes much deeper than that as well. It's a real sense of having to deal with, for instance, certain food products that were part of the staple diet becoming more difficult to, to find or at least being able to afford those and having to change to find other foods that, that, that you, wouldn't, you wouldn't normally eat as part of your diet. This has been another part of the aspect of how ordinary Venezuelans have had to deal with the extreme economic hardship that is occurring in the country today. Fourth, it is also important to recognise 
a number of negative forms of survival that have occurred, largely what could be deemed to be the flourishing of illegal economic activity in the country. Whether that be the resale of products that are come in the, in the food boxes that I've said, so if people get perhaps two bottles of oil in the box, but they only need one, they can go to the black market, sell that, use that money to then be able to buy other products that they need. That doesn't just happen with the products in the food boxes, it happens with other products as well. And we see that on a large scale on the border region, and we were able to witness that on the border region with Colombia, where you have large scale contraband going both sides of the border. So you have almost a, a, a semi loss of sovereignty when it comes to control of products that are, if one side of the border they're cheaper than the other, then they flow over to the other side in order to be resold and for people to be able to make a, a living through that way. The most classic example is petrol, which as I said is almost given away for free in Venezuela, but where at Colombia is sold at not quite the price that you would pay for it here, but certainly much higher than what you pay for it in Venezuela. So people might fill up their tank in their car, drive across the border, uh, siphon out the petrol and sell that and be able to make quite a lot of money uh, in, in relative terms uh, from that process. And to give you an idea of the scale of this contraband, the state oil company in Colombia no longer bothers to distribute petrol to the east side of Colombia because it just, and it's just essentially legalized what is this illegal flow of contraband over the border to allow many of the communities to be able to survive and, and to be basically get the distribution from that. The scale of the contraband goes beyond that because it's not only enough to do that, the state oil company, because it's gone through a process of legalizing it in Colombia, actually gets some of that illegal contraband and starts to refine it and, and, and export that as well. So this is just a small example of just a large scale of, 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 of this illegal economic activity that occurs on the border region. It goes beyond just simply the contrabands of goods as well, because the issue of the currency becomes a real problem as well. Currency becomes a problem with hyperinflation as prices continue to go up. Currency also becomes a problem when you're, un when you're unable to access hard, hard currency, actual cash bills to be able to pay for things. So what you see occurring is, for instance, the regular use, not just of US dollars as a substitute, um, but also of even the Colombian peso. So the places in, around the border where it was easier to buy stuff with Colombian pesos than with the local currency, the Bolivar, uh, just again, simply another mechanism for people to try to deal with some of the everyday harsh realities. Of course, once you see a flourishing of these illegal economic activities, you see, a, uh, you see a, a fertile ground for an increase in corruption as well, because those that have access or are unable to turn a blind eye can make money from, from, from this situation as well. Another aspect uh, that needs to be recognised as, a, what you, uh, as a, another mechanism that people have used is obviously the one that is, 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 the one that is, made, uh, uh, is focused in the media, which is immigration. Immigration out of the country, which began in large part, although not exclusively, but in large part sending one family member out of the country to send remittances back, US dollars back, which in the current context of the Venezuelan economy goes a long way if you're able to get access to US dollars. But now we just see large, you know, entire families leaving the country as another mechanism for, for dealing with, with, with the, the economic hardship. I want to turn now to the last one, I think, which is the most important aspect for really recognising what's occurring in Venezuela today. Because all of those are aspects of how everyday people are trying to get through a very difficult economic situation, uh, economic situation that it must be said, although as I said at the start, I can't go into the firm details, but that is every day being made worse and worse and worse by the US sanctions. It is incredible, the impact that these sanctions are having and to think that anyone, no matter what their politics are, could in any way support further deepening this economic hardship by these sanctions is, you know, is, oh, is clearly people who haven't been into Venezuela to see what the reality is, 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 is there. Um, so all of this situation, you know, is getting harder by day by day as the sanctions, more sanctions are applied on Venezuela to really strangle, uh, strangle the, the country's economy. But I think why, this, why we see the ongoing resilience um, of the Venezuelan people and what's always left out is the acknowledgement and a recognition of the ongoing endurance of Chavismo. Now, when I'm referring to Chavismo, as I don't mean the government or just the government, although the government is part of what is Chavismo. Rather, when I refer to Chavismo, I'm talking about a political movement of the poor, 
uh, political movement of the poor that exploded onto the political scene in the 80s and 90s, as I mentioned, through movements or uprisings like the Caracaso, but there are many others that we could talk about, bigger and smaller protests that occurred throughout all of those two decades. And it began to take political form under Hugo Chavez, who was first elected president in 1998. It is a movement deeply rooted in the popular sectors of Venezuela, in the barrios, in the countrysides, and in the military barracks as well. And it's made up of activists involved in various forms of social organisations, social movements, political parties, and as I said, extends into the military and into the popular civilian militias that have been established um, over the last decade in Venezuela. It is a political movement that is deeply anti-imperialist and a very politicised movement. It is a movement that anywhere you went in Venezuela you could see continues to exist and have important strength. And it is a movement that is completely aware of its long and short history, where anywhere you went you could have discussions with people about, as I said before, Venezuela's role in the struggle for independence. The reality of what Venezuela was like under the neoliberal governments, where people literally were dying of hunger so much that they would come out onto the streets in uprisings like the Caracasa that could only be put down through the deaths of thousands of people. And are also aware of the more recent history of what they were able to gain under the Chavez government. It's a movement that's aware of Venezuela's role in world politics as well. It understands exactly how many natural resources Venezuela has. Again, it was impressive who any, almost anyone you spoke to in Venezuela could tell you, this is the amount of oil we have under our ground. But it's not just oil, we've got coltan, we've got uranium, we've got diamonds, we've got gold. They tell you exactly where the mines were, they tell you exactly how much that was there. And they said, that's what everyone wants. And when they said everyone, they said not just the US, but we understand also that Russia and China are also interested in getting their hands on these resources. They were very conscious of their role in world geopolitics and what is occurring today uh, in, in Venezuela. It's also a political movement that saw some really fundamental changes occur in their everyday life under the Chavez government. Again, speaking to people on the streets, what was a constant thing that would come up? I was the first person in my family to be able to go to university. My mother or my father was finally able to go to high school, to, to or go back to high school to finish off their studies. This was never possible before Chavez. And when people tell us that they want to go back to the good days before Chavez, that's the days when we couldn't go to university. That's the days when we couldn't finish high school. So very conscious of those gains and do not want to give away those gains that have been made. Understanding, of course, that some of those have been rolled back as a result of the economic crisis. It is a movement that has reshaped politics and how the poor or how the popular classes view themselves and their place in politics. They understand that only Chavez, the only political project of the last century or last two centuries, arguably, going back to Bolivar, that in any way saw a role for popular sectors participating in politics was Chavismo. All of the other ones were based on the utter exclusion, marginalisation and complete ostracisation of these sectors from any discussion uh, in politics. It is a movement that is always critical self-critical and internally has a variety of positions. Many of them refer to it in shorthand as the class struggle within Chavismo or the struggle against bureaucratism or corruption. These were the constant discussions that one would have with even the most fervent supporter of Maduro. And of course there are different opinions towards Maduro himself, from those that support him 100% to those that oppose him and to those who have some criticisms but believe that, it's in, that Maduro is their president because they voted for him and that he deserves to continue to serve his mandate at least until a recall referendum is convoked against him or until his mandate finishes. Um, but that in the in-between the in time, no one else gets to decide for Venezuelans who their president is and that, those, and that the, 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 they will continue to try to resolve their problems in the current scenario. It's a movement that continues to maintain the support of anywhere, well, you know, obviously these figures are hard to see, but hard to tell, but even in the most conservative polls shows that this movement continues to maintain the support of 25% and in the more positive polls of 35% of the population. Now this is important to put into context because 
25 to 35 percent doesn't mean 75 to 65 are in the opposition or support the opposition. Almost any head of state in the world is going to have, and in many cases, a lower level of support than what the, the PSUV and Maduro currently have in Venezuela. But uh, opposition doesn't always then reflect into one, one type of politics. And so what you see is that those same polls show that, for instance, support for the National Assembly, which is seen as the, the, or the, the MUD, the Democratic Unity Roundtable, as the main coalition of the opposition, have been roughly the same number, uh, if not slightly less. Again, depends on which poll you pick. But if you wanted to be crude and, and divided, you could say a third, a third, a third. A third continue to support the government in one way or another. A third continue to support the opposition in one way or another, in all of its conglomerate of small parties, because the opposition is not one party, but, but many parties. And a third don't support either of the two for one reason or another, although perhaps at election time may come out and vote, vote for, for one or the other. Chavismo as a political movement is a movement that certainly has been hit hard as a result of the economic crisis, has lost some of the support and that has growing discontent within its ranks. That was expressed in some of the protests that occurred in what are heavily, or what traditionally been very Chavista neighbourhoods, very Chavista barrios that occurred in January at the beginning of this year and were certainly an initial warning sign of the kind of growing discontent that exists amongst some of these sectors. But protests, excuse me, which subsided as soon as a new factor entered into politics, and that was the factor of Juan Guaido and Trump's intervention on January 23. It's solid, a movement solidly anti-imperialist and that wants to resolve its problems it's themselves. It does not want the outside interference or other people like Trump coming to tell them who their president is. More than Maduro, more than oil, more than anything, to what I became convinced of in the visit is that the real target of the opposition, the real target of the US is this political movement known as Chavismo. It's because of Chavismo that despite everything that is occurring in Venezuela, the opposition is unable to get traction or at least, at least some traction in the popular sectors. Because this movement is so deeply rooted and has a real conscious understanding of its role in Venezuelan society and of what has occurred in Venezuelan society, whether we go back to the struggle for independence or whether we just look at more recent times. In order to get rid of Maduro, the opposition would have to win at least a section of the popular sectors and that would mean at least fracturing some of the support that Chavismo has in order to, to be able to win enough of the support of the population to be able to take power. But it can't do that and it struggles to do that. And it's because the opposition refused to acknowledge the reality of Chavismo and what Chavismo has meant for popular sectors. Not only does it refuse to acknowledge that, it can't do anything but hide its class contempt for these very sectors. And you see it in its discourse. You see it every time, and the popular sectors in Venezuela see it every time, and this is what they said to us when we spoke to them, every time that an opposition spokesperson comes out and says, we want to take Venezuela back to the better days of before Chavez. For the vast majority of the Venezuelans, life was not better under Chavez. That's just not anecdotal evidence, the statistical evidence, and the numerous uprisings that occurred in that period a testament to that reality, a reality that many of them lived, obviously not the younger people in Venezuela, the older generations lived and experienced and know exactly what occurred. And when they hear opposition people say that, they automatically turn off. They also turn off when they hear comments such as, for instance, Juan Guaido's spokesperson or one of his key spokesperson coming out about a week ago now saying that their struggle against the absorption of power, because this is the pretext that they use for opposing Maduro's presidency, that he has usurped power, um, saying that their struggle against the absorption of power is a 20-year-long struggle. So they're clear, and the opposition are clear, that their battle is not just about Maduro and today and whether him or Juan Guaido are the legitimate president. For them, the last 20 years of Chavismo in government is an illegitimate government. Why is it illegitimate? Because it doesn't include the traditional classes that always ran that country, or at least certainly ran that country for the 40 years from the fall of the dictatorship until Chavez arose. So every time they say stuff like that, for those people who were excluded from anything to do with politics for 40 years, and they hear the opposition say that, 
they know exactly what the opposition mean and so therefore do not want to be part of the opposition protest against Maduro. Many other examples of the kind of discourse that the opposition use that mean they cannot and unable to get any traction amongst the popular sectors, at least on a scale that would be necessary if they were to be successful in their campaign. And of course, when they're ultimately left with a discourse that's totally reliant on support for foreign intervention, more sanctions, war, military inter interference, none of this is something that ordinary people in Venezuela support, and none of this is something that will win over the popular sectors. Were this to change, perhaps the situation in Venezuela would be different, but there's no signs of this changing when it comes to the opposition. And what does all of this mean for solidarity? I think it's important to recognise that in Venezuela today, there's a confrontation between two blocks, two political blocks, the opposition and Chavismo. There's no real existing third independent force, um, even if there might be individual voices or individual uh, small organisations that are tr trying, trying their best to, to sort of exist in the, in the very difficult situation of extreme confrontation that is occurring at least at the up, upper levels and uh, um, political levels. You need to recognise that there's huge debate and differences within Chavismo, and that's always been the case and it continues to be the case today. And that given this, there's no reason why we cannot continue to allow for all of these different voices to be heard. In fact, what we need to be saying is that the media refuse to allow any of these voices to be heard. We only get at best one viewpoint, that's the opposition viewpoint. Occasionally, uh, a government press release uh, against the opposition, but never do we hear about the myriad of social organisations and social movements, those people that have made, constructed their own history over the last 20 to 30 years, and who deserve to have their voices heard and what they have to say about what's occurring in Venezuela. It's important to let these voices be heard and not allow them to be silenced, whether that be by the media, by the opposition, or even in some cases by the government. It's also important to, uh, to recognise the fact that the majority of these voices, and this includes large sections of the opposition, want to resolve the problems themselves. They reject the calls by opposition leaders for foreign interventions. And most of them recognise that there is an immediate a need to end the sanctions, to end the coup, to oppose any war in Venezuela and to oppose ongoing foreign interference. This is not just a demand or not just an issue in terms of being able to resolve the very real problems that Venezuelan people are facing that, as I said, are being worsened by the foreign interference, but it's also about helping those that are in the grassroots trying to really get on with building a, a better society. Those who find it very difficult to have their voices heard in this situation of extreme polarisation that is occurring and where people are essentially forced to, to take a one, one side or the other and where US interference and Trump's interference continually makes the situation a lot worse. I think for us here in Australia, it's really important to make sure that these voices are heard and make sure these voices get an, an audience and a, an ability to be able to have their opinions heard. Certainly it's important to do that before it becomes too late. Thank you.